Chapter 20, Sarajevo, The Web of Culpability. The secret elite failed to find their spark for the international conflagration in the Balkans because Germany, in the person of the Kaiser, restrained Austria-Hungary from overreacting to Serbia's deliberate provocation. Indeed, the dual monarchy was concerned that the German ambassador in Belgrade in 1914 was decidedly pro-Serb and had influenced the Kaiser to take a comparatively benign attitude towards the suburban Serbian cause. Yet it was clear that Austria could only absorb so much pressure before the integrity of the state was destroyed. The war makers required an incident so violent, threatening, and or dangerous that Austria would be pushed over the brink. Austria-Hungary was aware of the dangers that lay across the Serbian border. Their military intelligence had interpreted, had intercepted and deciphered a large number of diplomatic telegrams that detailed Russian involvement with several Serbian activist groups. They knew that Izvolsky's placement in Belgrade Nicholas Hartwig was manipulating the Serbian government to destabilize the region. They knew that Hartwig was in control of the internal politics of Serbia. They knew of his links back to Savnov, back back to Savnov, Savnov in Saint Petersburg, and to Izvolsky and Poincare in Paris but they were not aware of the real power centered in London. No one was. The links in the chain of command from London went further, deeper, and more sinister when extended from Hartwig into the Serbian military, their intelligence service, and quasi-independent nationalist society, the Black Hand, and deeper yet into the young Bosnian political activists who were willing to pull the trigger in Sarajevo, students whose ideas on socialism and reform were influenced by revolutionaries like Trotsky, as each level in the web of culpability extended away from the central secret elite chain of command, precise control became less immediate. Sazanov in St. Petersburg considered that Hartwig in Belgrade was carried away occasionally by his Salvo file sympathies, but did not, but did nothing to curtail him. Hartwig, in turn, supported and encouraged men whose prime cause he willingly shared, and whose actions he could personally approve, but not at every stage control. Hartwig, the Russian ambassador, worked in close contact with his military attache, Colonel Victor Artemenov who had been posted to Belgrade to advise the liaising the liaise with the Serbian army. These men were intrinsically linked to the assassins in Sarajevo by their chosen agent, the founder and dominating figure in the Serbian Black Hand and the most influential military officer in Serbia, Colonel Dragutin. Dmitry Jevic, or Apis, Apis, the English traveler and Balkan commentator, the English traveler and Balkan commentator, Edith Durham, described the Black Hand as a mafia-style society, as a mafia-type society, Masonic in secret self-promotion, infiltrating the Serbian military civil service, police, and government. It produces it produced its own newspaper, Pijamont, which preached intolerance to Austria, Hungary, and violent chauvinism. It became the most dangerous of political organizations, a government within the government, responsible to none. Crimes were committed for which no one took responsibility. The government denied any knowledge of it, yet King Petar was elevated to the throne by these men. 
efforts by responsible politicians to tackle the subversion of good government by the black hand came to naught. Hartwig's friendship and respect for Apis, Apis may be measured by his description of his group as idealistic and patriotic. And there is no doubt that it suited Hartwig's purpose to approve Apis' promotion to Chief of Intelligence in the summer of 1913. It is important that we clearly identify every link in the chain of responsibility that surrounded the fateful assassination in Sarajevo in June of 1914. Apis was deliberately given responsibility for an intelligence organization financed from Russia and informed by Bosnian Slavs. His life's purpose was the establishment of a greater Serbia. He was first and foremost and always a Serb. He worked in collusion with Hartwig's military attache, Artemenov, and secured a promise from him that Russia would protect Serbia should Austria attack them in the wake of his actions. For Apis, what was required was a demonstration of Serbian self-determination that would bring about permanent change and force the issue once and for all. The Austrian government presented the opportunity in March of 1914 when they announced that Arch Archduke Franz Ferdinand, here to the Habsburg dual monarchy, would visit Sarajevo in June. Political assassination as a means to an end was not a new concept. In the five years prior to 1914, lone assassins, mostly Serbian citizens of Austria-Hungary, made a series of unsuccessful attempts against Austro-Hungarian officials in Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. In 1912, two unsuccessful attempts were made on the Viceroy of Croatia and Royal Commissioner of Austria-Hungary. And in 1914, a similar attempt on the life of a royal commissioner was foiled. The Austrian government had reliable information that Serbian agitators, in conjunction with influential Russian circles, wished to strike a decisive blow against the Austrian monarchy, but had no precise details. Apis's organization was prepared. It had infiltrated a revolutionary group. Malada Bosna, the young Bosnians, and equipped and trained them to carry out the Sarajevo assassination. The young Bosnians held high ideals, far more intellectual than the narrow chauvinism of the Black Hand. They wanted to go beyond in independence from Austria -Hungary to Hungary to change the primitive nature of Bosnian society. They challenged the authority of existing institutions of state, church, school, and family, and believed in socialist concepts. Egalitarianism and the, and the emancipation of women, the young Bosnians stood for modernism, intellectualism, and a brave new world. They were spurred by revolution, not narrow nationalism. Apis knew just the man to organize and lead an assassination team of young Bosnians, Daniko Ilik. He had worked as a school teacher and a bank worker, but in 1913 and 1914, he lived with his mother, helping her run a small boarding house in Sarajevo. Ilik was leader of a Siberian black hand terrorist cell in Sarajevo leader of the Serbian Black Hand terrorist cell in Sarajevo, and as such was known to Colonel Apis personally. Ilik was also a close friend of Gavrilo Princip, the student destined to fire the fatal shot. Apis used three trusted Serb associates in planning the assassination. His right-hand man, Major Vajislav Tenkosik was in charge of guerrilla training and brought the would-be assassins to a secret location in Serbia 
where his specific role was to ensure that the young Bosnians knew how to handle guns and bombs effectively. He was tasked to teach them the art of the assassin and get them back over the border and into Sarajevo safely. The second, Raid Malobavic, was the chief undercover operative for, Ser for Serbian military intelligence. His name appeared in Serbian documents captured by Austria-Hungary during the war that described the running of arms, munitions, and agents from Serbia into Austria-Hungary under his direction. His assessment was that the young Bosnians were capable of the task. The third Black Hand conspirator was Milan Siganovic. Sign he supplied the assassination team with four revolvers and six bombs from the Serbian army's arsenal. Crucially, each of the assassins was given a vial of cyanide to take after they had murdered the Archduke. Their suicides would ensure that the trail would not be traced back to Apis and Hartwig. Siganovic Sig Siganovic played another equally important role. He was a trusted confidant of the Serbian Prime Minister, Nikola Pasic, and was ultimately protected by him from the volcanic fallout after Sarajevo. Critically, Siganovic, Sigano, Siganovic's involvement meant that members of the Serbian government knew in advance about the proposed assassination and had time to consider the consequences. Everything appeared to be running smoothly, but Serbian intrigues hit political turbulence at precisely the wrong moment. The unity of Serbia's political, military, and royal leaders nestling behind the muscle of the Russian minders had been a feature of Serbian success in the Balkan Wars. Prime Minister Pasik Colonel Apis and King Pitar were all supported by Ambassador Hartwig towards the ambitions of a greater Serbia. But suddenly, just days before the planned assassination, a power struggle erupted for control of the country. Apis attempt attempted to organize a coup to dismiss Pasik, allegedly over a minor detail of proceedings, but found that his power base in the Serbian military had shrunk. Many of his senior colleagues who had been involved with him since the first regicides in 1903 had died naturally or been killed in the Balkan Wars. The old order inexorably changes. Even his closest friends balked at unleashing military force against the civilian authorities. Many Serbs expected Apis to win outright victory in, his, in this power struggle but his foray into civil politics diluted the aura that had been associated with his leadership of the Black Hand. The Serbian cabinet drafted stringent measures against Black Hand membership, retiring highly placed officials and transferring others to the anonymity of remote Serbian outposts. But the killer blow of Colonel Apis's aspirations came from two external powers. Russia, more accurately, the sazanov isvolsky axis, would not countenance, countenance, would not countenance the removal of Prime Minister Pasik in his cabinet. Hartwig slapped down any notion of resignations. At the same time, Poincaré let it be known that a Serbian opposition regime could not count on financial backing from Paris. The king, caught between old loyalties and Russian pressure withdrew from political life. He transferred his powers to Alex Prince Alexander, who resented Apis's authority in the Serb Serbian military circles. Look again at these events. With the assassination just days away, the last thing the Sazanov Izvolsky Poincaré and the secret elite would have entertained in June of 1914 was a change of government in Serbia that did not owe its very existence to their power and money. Apis, the ultra-nationalist, was not a man to take orders. 
He had desperately wanted to attack Bulgaria in 1913, but Pasek, no doubt under instruction from Hartwig, had refused to sanction the order. Apis was neither deferential to Prince Apis was neither deferential to Prince Alexander nor under Hartwig's thumb. He knew that Pasek He knew that Pasek was weak and subservient to Russia. It was as if metaphorical scales had suddenly dropped from his eyes and he understood for the first time that the Russians were exploiting him and his beloved Serbia for their own purposes. Apis may also have had second thoughts about the assassination based on his own prospects of survival. He had clearly shaken the ruling cabal in Serbia. Prime Minister Pasek knew about the intended assassination and in consequence the cabinet allegedly closed the borders to known to known or suspected assassins if true was this self-preservation on their part an attempt to make it look like the serbian government had nothing to do with the shooting hartwick too knew details of the plans but never imagined they could trace back to him Crucially, he did not know that the Austrians were well aware of his intrigues because they had possession of decoded diplomatic correspondence between Russia and Serbia. Apis ordered a trusted agent to go to Sarajevo and instruct the young Bosnians to abort the mission. It was all too late. They were safely ensconced in Sarajevo, ready for the appointed day and ill-disposed to accept any postponement. The young Bosnians had slipped out of Belgrade on the 28th of May and been secretly routed, been secretly routed across the border by sympathetic frontier guards. Siganovic, Siganovic, Siganovic had ensured they had weapons and cash. Sig- Siganovic had ensured they had weapons and cash. The senior officer on the border guard at the time, a member of the Black Hand, had been placed there on special assignment by Apis's intelligence department. Intelligence department. Yet the Archduke need not have been killed. Warnings about the perilous nature of his safety abounded. Despite this, the governor of Bosnia, General Potiorek, was determined that the visit would go ahead. Desperate pleas from the chief of police, who believed that the Archduke was in grave danger, was were ignored. The very date of the visit, June 28, was particularly provocative. It was St. Vita's Day, historically and emotionally significant to the Serbs. The anniversary of the Battle of Kosovo, Kosovo Poil of 1389, the victory that unified the Serbian nation against the Turkish invader. That alone could have that alone should have been a warning. The police chief's fear was dismissed by the governor and ridiculed by Sarajevo's military committee when he requested a cordon of soldiers to line the streets as a precaution. He pleaded with them not to publish the route of the Archduke's cavalcade through the city but was ignored newspapers carried detailed notice of the time and place to view the archduke's entourage a a request that additional police officers be brought in from the country was rejected because it would cost too much security measures were left in the hands of providence the conspirators and there were seven in in the young bosnian team stood at intervals along the avenue called Apple Quay, called Appel Quay, or the Avenue of Assassins, as the Arch- Archbishop of Sarajevo would later dub it, and mingled freely with the crowds for an hour and a half before the Archduke's arrival. Though Bosnia could boast a first-class political intelligence, no one, no police officer, no undercover police agent, no vigilant citizen questioned them. The events of what might safely be deemed the world's most devastating assassination 
has been well documented. A botched bomb throwing left the Archduke shaken but physically unmarked. Officials of the following car were not so lucky. His cavalcade stopped briefly before continuing to the town hall. Strange speeches made pretense that all was well. Despite the shameful outrage, troops were not called in from the barracks, nor additional police summoned for protection. Franz Ferdinand demanded to go to the hospital to see for himself how one of the governor's assistants, wounded by the bomb blast, was flaring, was faring. Incredibly, the cavalcade returned along the same avenue of assassins on which the first bomb had been thrown, but turned into the wrong street. Potiorek ordered the driver to stop and reverse. In doing so, he placed the Archduke directly in front of young Princip, who promptly shot both him and his unfortunate wife, Sophie. The police arrested Princip on the spot before he could attempt suicide. And on a chance, wrong turn. And on a chance, wrong turn, we are expected to believe that the world went to war. Governor Potiorek's behavior was astonishing. The entourage was on its way to the hospital, but Potiorek ordered the driver to proceed to the governor's residence instead. Confused, we should be. A meticulously planned assassination succeeded despite the amateurism of the conspirators, only because the victim was more or less served up on a plate. Had Potiorek acted in shock, or did he know it was already too late? It was suggested at the time that Austria had set up the assassination deliberately in order to provoke a war. In the bitter rage of accusation and counterclaim that followed after 1914, all sides made allegations against one another. In the 1920s and over the decades since, much evidence has come to light from documents that have been lost or removed unofficially. There is now a huge body of diplomatic evidence that links Russia and Serbia to the assassination, but none that support the suggestion that the low security visit of Archduke Ferdinand to Sarajevo was in some way organized with the intention of exposing him to the risk of assassination. Had the great crime gone to plan, all the young Bosnians would have committed suicide. They were expendable. Dead Bosnians tell no tales. The links in the chain of responsibility would have been broken. The headline they saw was of a noble death pact assassination that would leave the authorities completely bewildered and the coffee houses of Europe abuzz with revolutionary adm admiration. Kabrinovic who threw the first bomb, immediately swallowed his Sinai and leaped 15 feet into the shallow river, Miljaka. Police officers hauled him out of the mud flat, vomiting uncontrollably. The Sinai failed to be effective for any of the young Bosnians. There was to be no self-directed martyrdom. With suspicious ease, the Austro-Hungarian authorities arrested all but one of the Sarajevo assassins, together with the agents and peasants who had assisted them on their way. How they managed to track all of the alleged conspirators so quickly begs the question of how much they knew in advance. The major charge against the young Bosnians was conspiracy to commit high treason, which carried a maximum sentence of death. Within a few days of the assassination, the Austrians had set up a judicial investigation. They were convinced that the young Bosnians had been equipped from Belgrade and that the plot had originated from there. What the Austrians desperately needed to know was the extent to which Pasek's government was directly involved. The Austro-Hungarian Foreign Ministry sent its top legal counselor, Dr. Friedrich von Weisner, an official investigator to Sarajevo. On, 13th, on the 13th of July, 1914, he forwarded an interim report to Vienna containing three major points. One, the Greater Serbia movement aimed to serve 
aimed to sever the southern Slav region from Austria by revolutionary violence, he pointed an accusatory finger at Narodna Obrana, yet another Serbian nationalist movement, possibly confusing it with the black hand, stating that Belgrade's government let it have an absolutely free hand. Point number two, he named Major Tankovic, Tankovic, he named Major Tankovic and the Serbian official Siganovic for training and supplying the assassins with weapons and both the frontier author authorities and the custom officers for smuggling them into Bosnia. These facts he deemed demonstrable and virtually unassailable. End point three, he concluded by stating cautiously that there was no conclusive proof at that time of the Serbian government having any knowledge of the assassination or having cooperated in planning it. Dr. Von Wisner's oral report delivered two, some two days later was more comprehensive. By then, he had unearthed more evidence of Siberian complicity but his telegram report of, 13th, of the 13th of July was destined to be hijacked and later grossly misrepresented by the American delegation at the War Guilt Commission in 1919. Their two most senior delegates, Secretary of State Robert Lansing and Counselor James Scott Brown, deliberately extracted a 31-word soundbite from Von Wisner's brief report which they claimed proved that Austria had no evidence against Serbia that justified war. It was a deliberate misrepresentation that gave the impression that Dr. Von Wisner believed that Serbia was utterly innocent in 1914. Such a falsification suited their cause. It was used as part of the post-war onslaught against Germany and Austria to lay the blame for war entirely on their shoulders. The Americans, Lansing and Brown, now stand accused of deliberately falsifying history in a desperate attempt to malign Austria and Germany. By October, when the young Bosnians were brought to trial, the Austrian authorities had overwhelming evidence of Serbian complicity. Despite this, the conspirators insisted in deflecting blame from Serbia. Under cross-examination, Princip was defiant. I believe in unification of all South Slavs in whatever form of state and that it be free of Austria. Asked, end quote. Asked how he intended to realize his goal, he responded, by means of terror. End quote. Although they had been trained in Serbia, the young Bosnians had no knowledge of the influence that had been exerted further up the chain of command. Indeed, few, if any, within that chain knew who was empowering the next link. Princip and his group genuinely believed that they were striking a blow for freedom and emancipation and could not bring themselves to accept that they had been duped into firing someone else's bullets. The Austrian court did not accept their attempt to hold Serbia blameless. The verdict was decisive. The court ignored Princip's claim and stated bluntly that the military commanders in charge of the Serbian espionage service collaborated in the outrage. Four of the young Bosnians were executed by hanging in February of 1915, but the younger members, like Princip, were given prison sentences. He died in prison in 1918 from tuberculosis exacerbated by a botched amputation. Crucially, the trial of culpability had not been covered over. Above all else, the secret elite had to ensure that no links could be traced back to Russia. Evidence of her complicity in the Archduke's death would have altered the balance of credibility for the in, for the Entente cause. All links to Sazanov in particular had been airbrushed. That in turn meant that the web of intrigue between Serbia and Russia had to be cleansed. 
The outbreak of war in August slowed down this process but only delayed the outcome. The Russian ambassador died in very strange circumstances. On a routine visit to Baron von Geislingen, Austrian ambassador of Belgrade, on July 10, 1914, Hartwig collapsed and died from a massive heart attack. The Serbian press immediately published several inflammatory articles accusing the Austrians of poisoning Hartwig while he was a guest at the, their legation. The Austrians, of course, knew from decoded diplomatic telegrams that Hartwig was at the center of intrigues against Austria-Hungary. Was this the old-style fashion of retribution? Or were the secret elite simply very fortunate that the 57-year-old diplomat dropped dead in the Austrian legation? Denials echoed around Europe, nowhere more vehemently than in Britain, where the secret elite had to vilify any suggestion that Russia was involved with internal Bosnian or Austro-Hungarian politics. The Times led the outcry. The latest suggestion made in one of the Serbian newspapers is that M. D. Hartwig's sudden, sudden death in the Austro-Hungarian legation at Belgrade the other day was due to poison. Ravings of that kind moved the contempt as well as the disgust of cultivated people, whatever their political sympathies may be, end quote. Ravings indeed. The Times and those it represented clearly wanted to squash such speculation. It was far too close to the truth. If the idea that Hartwig had been murdered because he was involved in the Archduke's assassination gained credence, British public opinion would turn even further against Russia. At the request of the Serbian government, Hartwig was buried in Belgrade in what was virtually a state funeral. Every notable Serbian, including the Prime Minister, attended Officially, Hartwick suffered death by natural causes. Unofficially, a very important link in the chain of culpability was buried along with his corpse. Some three years later, with the tide of war turned violently against Serbia, the Austrians demanded the immediate arrest and trial of Colonel Apis and the officers loyal to him. They were indicted. They were yeah, they were indicted on various false charges unrelated to Sarajevo at the Serbian court martial held on the frontier at Salonika. On March 23, 1917, Apis and eight of his associates were sentenced to death. Two others were sentenced to 15 years in prison. One defendant died during the trial and the charges against him were dropped. The Serbian High Court reduced the number of death sentences to seven. Regent Alexander commuted four others, leaving three to face the firing squad. Colonel Apis effectively signed his own death warrant when he confessed to the Salonika court that in agreement to Artemanov, the Russian military attache, I hired Malobabic to organize Ferdinand's murder upon his arrival to Sarajevo. The explosive part of that statement was the opening phrase in agreement with Artemanov. His revelation of Russian involvement had to be silenced. Much, of, much to his own despair, for Colonel Apis truly believed right up to the point of death that his contacts in England, France, and Russia would intervene on his, on his behalf. He was executed on the 26th of June, 1917 by a firing squad. In reality, Apis was silenced, put to death by order of a Serbian government that desperately needed to permanently bury its complicity with Russia in the Sarajevo assassination. It was judicial murder. By one means or another, the lower edges of the web of culpability were blown away. The young Bosnians had, in their naivety, been willing sacrifices to a cause they never knew existed. Hartwig was dead. Murdered? Probably. But all that really mattered was that his voice would never be heard again. 
our our, under, our understanding of his role in managing the Russian intrigues has to remain at best incomplete. There was plenty to hide, and no doubt that, that and no doubt at all about Russian complicity. The Soviet collection of diplomatic papers from the year 1914 revealed an astonishing gap. During the first days of the October Revolution in 1917, Hartwig's dispatches from Belgrade for the crucial period between May and July of 1914 had been removed by an unknown person from the archives of the Russian Foreign Ministry. Three years dead, and his was a voice they still had to gag. Finally, Apis and his Black Hand associates were removed from any future inquiry or the temptation of a lucrative memoir. Blown away, all of them, in the expectation that the truth about their contributions would disappear in the confusion of war. Summary Chapter 20 Sarajevo, The Web of Culpability the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand was orchestrated through a chain of culpability that stretched from Sarajevo to Belgrade, Belgrade to St. Petersburg, and then on to Paris and London. The Russians, Hartwig and Artemenov, liaised with the Serbian nationalist Dmitry Jevic, a.k.a. Apis, and the Black Hand organization to underwrite the plan to underwrite and plan the assassination. The young Bosnians, as much more a much more idealistic and intellectual group, became the agents through whom Apis planned the assassination. The assassination was almost called off at the last moment by Apis when an internal political power struggle in Serbia broke out between him and Prime Minister Pasic. But the Russians, through Hartwig, squashed the attempted coup. The protection of the Archduke on the day of the assassination was so negligible as to make it incomprehensible to today's readers. The assassin's attempt to commit suicide failed because the Sinai did not work. Serbian complicity was easily proven, but steps were taken to remove any evidence that might link the organization to Russia or even further back. The Austrians had broken the Serbian diplomatic code and captured documents that detailed anti-Austrian activities. Following the assassination, they amassed a significant body of evidence implicating Serbia. Hartwig died, almost certainly murdered, at the Austrian embassy in Belgrade. Apis was shot by firing squad in 1917 on a trumped-up charge unrelated to Sarajevo. Hartwig's correspondence with, Saran with Sazanov in Russia mysteriously disappeared in 1917. Princip died in prison from tuberculosis in 1918. These deaths coincidentally protected the chain of command that led back to St. Petersburg, Paris, and London.